Hello, you bromish the interwebs. This is Silver Quill, the man that met the hippogriff, coming to you from the MBS show, which I have hijacked. <laughs> because now it's time for the spectacle. It's time for the show. It's time for me to introduce the man who talks about movies and draws like there's no tomorrow, James Cork. Hello, everyone. That is the best intro. No my heart is anybody in any more I'm gonna cry. This is so good. I'm so happy to be here. I wanna thank the Academy. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong speech. Hey, guys. And on that note, we have the slightly less whiny, but still awesome, Norman Sanzo. Razzle dazzle, glitz and glam, turn it up, it's the spectacle. Hello. And today we talk about an episode that has many different meanings. It is the penultimate of season five. It is the last episode of Amy Keating Rogers' tenure on the show, and it features the vocal talents of Broadway singer Lena Hall. It is the main attraction. Woohoo! Yay! Yay! Woo! Applause! Light up that 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 light up. <laughs> uh, what to say about this one? What to say about this one? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to ask you, because as I have hijacked this show, we're going to go in the order that I darn well please, which means, Norman, oh. make your mark. Well, how do I put this? I was very in the dark when this episode came out. All I know was Lena Hall was coming. I didn't even hear her thing play on the, what I call this, EQD. All I know that she was going to be on the show. Other than that, I was in the dark. Watch the show, watch the episode. Love it. Anything you want to add to why you love it? The music was awesome. The characteristics of the characters were awesome. The visual, the little baby ponies, the fillies, like they're so cute. Ah, uh, Applejack in, like, ah, heart exploding. I need my heart medicine. <laughs> ah, James, take over. Uh, yes. I can give you your nitro, it's okay. <laughs> uh, oh, should I say what I think of it? Yes, but say it backwards. I want to challenge you. <laughs> okay. That's not a word. Okay. Uh, That's not a word. Hey, hey, language, go. sir. Language. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you cannot censor that. <laughs> uh, surprise you didn't get angry about what I said about your, about your mom. <laughs> She's a tough lady. I am gonna, I'm gonna confess something. We were recording this on the 17th of January. I watched the episode on the 16th of January. When this episode aired, I was at Brownie Scott. And, I, of course, I wasn't available to watch it. I was attending my, my vendor table and uh, meeting all those wonderful people that, that were at that con. And when I came back home, I didn't really catch up watching it because I had a lot of things to take care of during that week. And then the season finale happened. And I always had that weird disconnect. It's like, well, the season is over. I... I don't really know how jarring it will be to watch this episode. And I kept putting it, putting it behind, putting it behind and like forgetting about it. It's like, okay, I'm going to watch something else and this and that. And I didn't watch it until yesterday. I watched it yesterday, perhaps with all the hype gone. And yeah, it's pretty good. I wouldn't say it's the strongest Amy Gideon Roger, Amy Gideon Rogers episode this season, but a boy is it a breath of fresh air for the character of Applejack that this is one of the few episodes where I can look at her and go, oh my god, she's not a silly pony. She's actually she's actually very good. She's she's great. She kind of, in a way, eclipses the character of Coloratura, which is kind of interesting to to, to think about. Last time they introduced a new character in, in the in the show, they it, it eclipsed every other character, but not in this one. I think they, are, they both come off on the same level, which is pretty neat. And for my part, this is Applejack's best episode of the series, in my eyes. It shows her at her best, it shows her faults, but it shows her helping another pony, which is where she truly shines. Even though a lot of the emphasis is on the Countess, uh, it, Applejack is the heart of the episode, and so it doesn't feel like she gets overshadowed. Pinky is still great and enjoyable, but we'll also have a, a discussion of a truly despicable character. I do have a question though. You say this is the best episode of Applejack. No more Sisterhood Social. I thought that was that was your best uh, from the top that, ten best Applejack moments. This is the best Applejack centered episode. Ah, oh, oh, okay. She, yeah, she was, was a supporting her, character. Support Sisterhood Social was her best moment, but this is her best episode, start to finish. 
Gotcha, gotcha. I, I yeah, mean, I can actually see that. Let's let's uh-huh. be honest. Applejack episode, she tends to get usurped by some element. Uh, well, yes, there's that. There's a uh, Apple Buck season, which was basically so. How many memes really focus on Applejack in that? Here it's Applejack. Applejack is front and center. Yeah, that is true. Even when the the episode focused on her, she was shafted to the side. On this one, she's more like you said. She's more the focus of it. Which exactly. Is, it's a joy. It's a joy. It's a joy. So let us let us commence with the joy. Let us commence. Here comes the spectacle. Here comes the spoilers. <laughs> oh, so we'll be doing this scene by scene or teams? I think scene by scene works. Which features, of all things, apples in an Applejack episode. Who knew? Wow. What was this again? Again, um, the uh, charity Palooza something for what now? Yeah, let's see here. It is it is a concert that they put together for the Helping Hooves Music Festival. Anything other than that? Just that Applejack uh, has some experience, but they also reference Pinkie Pie and the Pony Palooza Rock Concert, a book by, I believe, GM Barrow. Yeah, yeah I think this is the first time that they cross-reference, right? It is, cross which reference. is, yes, cross-media continuity. That, <laughs> but... Yeah. Which is a double-edged sword, because if you accept one book, does that mean you have to accept all the others, including Twilight and the Crystal Heart spell? Here's the thing that we all need to understand, that every media that goes through is overseen by Hasbro. It has the Hasbro's thumbs up. So if this is okay, what's to say that the, whatchamacallit, this Crystal Heart book is not part of the canon universe? Because if, do you remember how Trixie and Gilda appeared in that book? No, I haven't read that. Oh. I don't Believe. remember. Were they in that book as well? They were. They were pulling pranks and creating cons, and they were sort of the negative influence on Twilight as she was trying to think about being a princess. And boy, that book really fell flat for me. That's a review for another time. Basically, cross-referencing media can be a double-edged sword. Because then you could say the comics are canon, and then the good, the bad, and the ponies happen. Yeah, the, or the, even worse, because it's what people get mad. Then Flash Sentry is also canon because the comics are canon with the Quest Records movies. That means that Flash Sentry is also canon. Ah. Well, he appeared in the show. I don't know if you can if you can say he doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, I think that what what people got mad was when they were they were wondering where is Twilight's library? We don't see it. And one of the show writers went, "Oh, you saw it in, in Rainbow Rocks." And people were like, "Rainbow Rocks is canon. That means Flash Sentry and the romance with Twilight Sparkle is canon as well." Basically, if if it can be dramatized, fandom shall dramatize it. Oh, of course, and that's not exclusive to this fandom. But yeah, sometimes you are like, "Oh, guys, seriously, calm mm-hmm. down." But. Let's carry on before we are stuck in this limbo of what is canon and what is not canon. Well, Pinkie Pie wants to break out the party canon because she is running in, saying to everyone, she got the biggest pony pop star in Equestria. Silver Quill? Oh, if only. (laughs) Sapphire Shores? Oh, please. Now, now Sapphire Shores has been denounced to second biggest pony pop star. Now, why is Rarity not having a conniption at this? This is her main client, her big name. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. That's like someone coming to me and saying, "Oh, James, you're you're doing uh you're doing artwork for Silver Quill. That's not as impressive as doing artwork for the Nostalgia Critic." And I'm like, "Shut up! <laughs> like that doesn't matter. You have any idea how thrilling it is to be doing work for someone, regardless of their position? I'm pretty sure that Rarity is uh, well above that, so she doesn't say anything about it." Well, I hope it's thrilling to do my artwork. I, I like, Dude, I enjoy it. it. It's super awesome to work with you. Come on, it's it's oh. the best. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, we have we have dramatic. Oh my gosh! Everyone's so excited for Countess Colora Turtle. <laughs> you mean Colora Tura? No, Colora Turtle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ruined it now. I cannot. I cannot see the name any other way. <laughs> and meanwhile, Applejack is all like, "Who is this Countess?" Countess colored a, term, a tumor. Oh, God. <laughs> and all the ponies are like, oh my God, she doesn't know. Like, oh my God. Well, it is kind of blurry because how many pop stars do you have in Equestria? So 
if you don't know, that is like, <gasps> La Casse. Well, I don't know. I mean, ever since the Backstreet Bucks were uh, in session, people are just sort of mad about the whole thing. Yeah, they're in sync now. Well, they're Wait, in what? sync. <laughs> uh, you got to work on your boy band references, James. No, is that I know I know fairly well who the Backstreet Boys are and everything and NSYNC and everything. But don't you tell me that the Backstreet Boys became NSYNC? What? Uh, You're joking, in, right? In, no, in that you in the pony. Come on, it's a joke. It, it's for the pony I'm, verse. I'm, I'm showing I'm showing here my lack of knowledge when it comes to boy bands because I was a Spice Girls guy. Okay, <laughs> I mean, come on. They were all so hot. Shut up. Oh, uh, anywho. So basically, we get flashback to adorable Applejack. Oh, yeah. Before the explanation of Pinkie Pie saying who this Coloratura is, the hoop that she need to get Coloratura was just not fun. And knowing that Applejack knows this pony... <laughs> and we established that this Countess is very uh, demanding. Mm-hmm. At least Pinkie Pie says so. Yep. But then we, but then we get this great flashback to Philly Applejack, uh, who... Okay, if this does not bring out some sort of doll, I suggest you check for a pulse. Checking. I have a pulse. I have a pulse. I'm alive. I, oh, yeah. Oh, there is. There is. Almost in the family. Doll. 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 Yeah, that's my pulse on that scene. So, and now we have uh, cutie marks that glow. So there's cutie mark magic. There you go. We're finally tying into the toys. Actually, I'm surprised they haven't made a toy of uh, of uh, Ra-Ra. It's just easier to call her Ra-Ra. The the one thing that I that I have to say about this this scene, uh, it kind of it struck me as weird. I don't know if everybody else felt like that when they watched the the, the episode, but that voice coming out of that little character. I know, I know, it was jarring. Doesn't sound like a kid. Doesn't sound, yeah, doesn't sound like a kid. I'm not alone. God, I'm so I'm so glad. That would be the only nitpick I have to say about this oh, episode. Yeah. Obviously, uh, but here's the thing: they paid thousands of thousands of dollars to get her on. So she's singing. I don't care. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not uh, criticizing Lena Hall's talent. God forbid, I'm doing that. Is that uh, the they they could have gone around the whole boys? issue designing the character differently when you have a character that has the same design as uh, Twilight and Moon Dancer when they are little or like Philly Applejack and all that and you put them the same voice uh, that's kind of weird they could have made her uh, they could have made her a little bit older and uh, get but, away with that but I'm going to counter this with most singers uh, when they're young or old they have a very powerful tone so I I'm going to disagree with it jarring well I'm playing devil's advocate here, but I personally I do find it jarring. But I do see people, oh, young people with strong voices. Not minding it. You 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 find it jarring, but you don't you you see it. It's not it a deal happen. breaker. It's not a deal breaker. No, it's not a deal breaker for me either. But it's the only neat pick, like I said, the only neat pick that I could get out of this episode. Mm-hmm. Well, meanwhile, Norman's possessed by the devil. Burn <laughs> the witch. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, so. Basically, we just had sort of an adorable flashback establishing part of Applejack's history. Part of what made her a good hometown girl was summer camp. Oh, by the way, first time we don't see Applejack with her cowboy hat. Yes, instead she's got a regular hat. Anyway, so, but the time has come. The Countess Cucumber Turnip (laughs) appears. Uh, With behold. Really? (laughs) Yep. Sorry, Her. that's going to be a shtick on this episode. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the, the, the Countess appears in all her finery and mane. Just like, how is she not tripping on that thing? Like 50 times over. Well, as Fluttershy. Uh, I, well, Fluttershy just makes it look subtle, but there's nothing subtle about this pony. She, How she even sees through a veil, wavy hair. I'm surprised she hasn't broken her neck 50 <laughs> times over. Uh, oh. As for designs, it does scream Lady Gaga. And we meet her manager. Uh, Let's see. What was the name of this bozo? Sven Gallup. Sven Gallup. Sven Gallup. Is, now, as I remember, there's a there's a fictional character named Sven Gali, mm-hmm. who was also a manager, but he took full advantage of his clients in every possible way. Let's keep it PG and just say every possible way. If I'm not mistaken, he was, uh, according to the wiki page... Uh, Sven Gali is a fictional character in Juro du Maru. Wow, Maru. Look at it yourself. In the eighteen 
1995 novel Trippy. Svengali is a Jewish of Eastern European origins who's uh, okay, nominates and uh, okay. Well, it's a fun read. Go ahead. Yeah, just on and on. Yeah, he does some uh, questionable things. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, I got to ask right away. What what were your impressions of this manager? The things that I have to say about this guy, I cannot say them here. And just to avoid having Sweetie Bot to go, that's not a word. I'm just going to put it and say that this is perhaps the most, one of the most despicable characters the show has had in quite some time. And that's saying something. He's a scumbag. I need to ask, in terms of scumbags, um, higher or lower than the Flim Flams? I will put him higher. <laughs> All right, then. Because the Flim Flams are, at least know how to sing. This guy has no idea oh, yeah. of singing. At least the Flim Flams have showmanship. Come on, we give them yeah. that. The, the, the staging that I came up with. Oh, yeah, the staging that you came up with is just auto-tune. Very original. <laughs> hey, 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 auto-tune is an art when done right. No, auto tune is not. Uh, auto tune is like the easiest way you can ruin a song. Not really. It depends on how you use it. It's a tool. If you use yeah, exactly. it right, if you use yeah, it yeah. Right. If you use it, if you use it, you can ruin a song. If you don't use it, you don't ruin the song. There you go. That's how, depends on how you use it. Yeah, yeah. That. I, t- I clearly <laughs> we are at disagreement here. I disagree. Uh, well, I disagree with that disagreement. Well, in any case, we move on to well. Just the manager making all these demands of Pinky and Pinky meeting them exceedingly, including a scene where Sven Gallup references every Amy Keen Rogers uh, episode, just about to date. <laughs> really? I mean, he's name dropping like there's no tomorrow. All right. Uh, could you enlighten us? Well, let's see here. I'd have to get the whole thing, but there's flowers from the Crystal Empire, I believe, pastries from Gustav Legrand. Cherries from Sweet, uh, from a Cherry Jubilee's farm. Uh, I believe a couple other references. Basically, all of these were episodes that Amy Keen Rogers had hand in. <laughs> How could I not see that? Dang. So she is name dropping herself in an episode she wrote. <laughs> and if you think about it, right, all the demands were virtually impossible for a normal pony, but not Pinky, because Pinky knew all of those people. <laughs> so it was just. Oh, uh, Gustav, could I have some eclairs? Ooh, Cherry, could I have some cherries? It's like, oh, this was simple for her. But, she, but even she's getting stressed by all this. Well, anywho, it comes about time for Countess Claudia Turtle <laughs> to do her big performance. <laughs> but not before Applejack expresses some doubts. And Rarity tries to uh, assure her, well, creative types are usually high demand and quirky. And times change people. Now, Rarity also praises the dynamics of this uh, rehearsal which is lights and spectacle and choreographed dancing. And yes, even the auto-tune is a certain art form. I mean, we can look down on it for the effect it has, but it still requires a certain degree of precision, especially when you have to cast the spell on the performer live. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And the casting is Prince. Hmm. Yeah, or formerly known as Prince, but then known as Prince again. I don't know anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that reference. I just love that reference. It looks like Rainbow Dash's brother is on stage, too. Oh, or her dad, or her dad. Hard times. Hard times. But here's the thing. Rarity has a point that there is a tremendous amount of talent that goes into this. Uh, it takes a lot of time, effort, and performance, and to Sven Gallup's credit, he organizes this. However, Rarity has a history of putting form over function. All of this covers up the Countess. Basically, cutlery touring is... Uh, is being obscured by her own performance. You could basically substitute any pony in there. And I think that's where Rarity is wrong. Now that you mention it, for us, for me personally, when I heard the song, the spectacle, I love it. I, I do like the whole song with how the beat goes and how everything it is. Like, with, even with the altitude, Daniel Ingram did an awesome job at uh, this it, song. It has a very gaga feel to mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. as well. But well, once you explain it, that way, Silver, it does seem that, yeah, all those blinks and blanks are covering up the artist. And even with the autotune, it's not giving the artist credit to her voice. That's my problem with autotune, uh, actually. The way that you put it is, like, it covers up the vocal range of the singer. You could totally put uh, another another person's voice in there, and of course it's going to sound fine, because, yeah, autotune is a, 
okay, it's a form of art. You can play around with the voice and all that, but it's not the real voice. It's a digitized version of their voice. That's why I consider autotune such a, okay, art form and everything, it's, uh, when you know how to use it, yeah. But I guess it's the difference between, it's like when people say, oh, digital art is not real art. Real art is real art. I should introduce you to my friend who says exactly that. Ah. <laughs> uh, we finally get to see the other side of Countess Cuddly Attire <laughs> as she greets How the many film. more do you have? How many more do you have? That's so amazing. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with him right now. I'm we're, with him. We're, we'll, we'll keep going as long as we can. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. But anyway, the Countess goes to meet Little Phillies, and son of a gun, there's Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon in the background. And they're not acting mean. Progress. Yay. Continuity. And we also see photo finish. Yay. Photo finish. I, fo- I photo finish him here, but I say nothing. <laughs> but still, we got to see photo finish. She's, I'm guessing, resting on a pony for them. But this is a cool moment for the Countess where she has a meet and greet with kids. And this is always fun. If you guys don't mind me telling the story, there was an event at Everfree Northwest where there was a storybook telling for the kids, you know, for 12 and under, something like that. And there was a surprise guest reader for them. And guess who it was? It was Princess Celestia. Yes. It was her, she was there, and she read the books to the kids. And uh, the kid was hyped. They, they were enjoying the moment. And having that reflect here with the Countess, having a meet and greet, taking photos, and, you know, just meeting the fans in this shape and form, is just really awesome. Was was Celestia reading uh, Fifty Shades of Grey? No, uh, I think it was... And then you ruin it. <laughs> it's silver. <laughs> How about go to the bleak to sleep? <laughs> oh, I think she read that one. No, 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 no. I, I think it was the, I would think it was the PG oh. one. Oh, God. Cthulhu mythos for, for you and me. But there is, there is a children's book based on the Cthulhu mythos. It's amazing. Ooh, I, I, I wonder if she read the Star Wars books. You know, those, um, kid books. Oh, Remember yes. Those? Yeah. Yes. The, the Darth Vader, uh, uh, with Luke and Leia. Yeah. yeah. That'll be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> we, we saw we saw those when we were at back 2014, uh, man. Uh, but anyway, but anyway, uh, Silver, continue on, please. All right. Well, basically, Applejack is happy to see the, this side of her friend that she remembers. Meanwhile, Sven Gallop is just trampling Pinkie Pie, and I was like, "You be mean to Pinkie Pie." Is there any way to cement yourself as a villain? You'd have to be mean to Fluttershy. But here's the question I want to pose to you two. How is Sven Gallop different from Sassy Saddles? Hmm. Uh, um, both are ma- both are managers. Both take extreme liberties with their role. I think that the main difference is that in the end, Sassy Saddles was working forth for the uh, for the boutique for what Rarity was producing, even though she was putting herself in the spotlight, and even though she had a turnaround. Uh, towards the la- in the last five minutes of the episode, uh, her reasons to have such turnaround were like a bit more sensible and a bit more relatable than whatever uh, Sven Gallop is doing, because he's doing it. I'm doing this because I deserve it. No, you don't. You are doing it because you're a spoiled brat, and you shouldn't be abusing others for fa- for favors. Well, besides gender, of course. But I think that's m- perhaps the main difference between the both of them. I think the difference between Sven Gallop and Sassy is if Rarity hadn't changed Sassy's way, we could have another Sven Gallop, but in female form. Like you see here, he's a jerk who takes advantage of his client and make them their slaves while he elevates his own status and his own self. Also, we don't see uh, we don't see Sassy Saddles abusing any of the main six. Uh, we only see her being pushy with rarity. Well, that's not yet really. And because... in, in the and kind of in the end, Sassy Saddles was right because rarity got away, got out of the design for the princess dress, and that princess dress that got out of the design didn't get sold because when you get out of what the commissioner is asking you to design, <laughs> you can get trouble. You're being told that this is not what I wanted. This give me something different. So I think Sassy Saddles has more reasons 
to to behave the way that she behaves. But and that's... Bengalov, who's acting more like a spoiled... Yeah, but that uh, could be style. the beginning. One right does not make... I don't forget the phrase, but... Two wrongs don't make one right. Yeah, something like that. You have that situation there. But like I'm saying, Sassy, if she was not taught what's right and wrong, could have gone the path of Sven Gallup. That's how I look at it. And for my two cents, uh, Sassy made a mistake. She was trying to express her own uh, creativity through a, a solid business plan. But she got too into it and accidentally sort of galloped off with Rarity's creations. Uh, meanwhile... Sven Gallup here, he fully realizes he's manipulating someone. He is with intent usurping her position to benefit himself. There's no care for creating something. It's just break in the benefits. There's a tremendous, more overt, selfish intent with him. You're saying that Sven Gallup knows what he is doing and Sassy is letting her business plan get in the way of her rationale? Uh, her excitement, really. Her own ambition for creating something, whereas Sven Gallup's ambition is to consume benefits for himself. Well, not only that, but I think that the character of Sassy Saddles is almost acting from fear, because when Rarity is like, I'm closing the boutique, I'm putting everything on sale, Sassy is freaking out. So I think that she's acting more out of both fear and ambition than just ambition. Well, the way you put it, Sven Gallop is definitely acting not just out of ambition, but selfishness. And if you're into music media and whatnot, uh, back in the days, most of the boy bands were developed. They're kind of, you know, um, carbon copy, marketed and whatnot. And their managers are just, well, Sven Gallops. Oh, dude, absolutely. This is nothing new. Nowadays, most artists, they develop themselves. It's rare to see, the well, Studio developed artists, not including Korea, but still. All right. Well, that's something I hope people will ponder the differences between Sassy Saddles and Sven Gallup. But meanwhile, we, we return to Applejack trying to talk to Countess uh, Counting a Trillion. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. At this point, you must have a war dog with all of the different. I cannot believe it. How many. How many more do you have? My gosh, we'll, I'll have to we'll, find out. We'll find out. But basically, Applejack <laughs> just, as being a, a straightforward, borderline blunt pony, she just says, you're being used. This isn't you. And yet the, the count, Countess, she uh, she stands up for her manager. She says, he's done so much for me. I I was nothing before him. And personally, I was very fascinated. I'd like to know the history here. Did she struggle? Did Sven Gallup find her during a very dark period where she didn't think she was going to make it? Was she vulnerable and he just sort of took advantage of that? I think that could be the case if you think about it. Like an up-and-coming artist who tries to get her name out there in the business, it's not easy. You have to try and fail multiple times just before you can get there. Sven Gallup sees that these girls have potential and she needs the My Magic Touch. There's a possibility that Sven Gallup here was an honest manager, but the power got to his head. Very possible. Uh, there is, there is also, it's also the tragedy of the, the, you know, the artist world in both, like, whether you're a singer, voice actor, artist, whatever, where you can have the talent, you can have the, a, a certain amount of attention, but you are definitely not there yet. And you need to depend on those types to springboard you into a stardom. Like, until you don't have the support of people like that, you are not uh, w known enough. And then, when you have the fame, and you are, you know that you could depend solely on your talent to be there, you keep depending on that person that put you in there, because you fear that if you are going to lose them, you're going to lose what you have right now. So... That that can happen. I mean, maybe that's why uh, uh, Princess, uh, oh, Princess. I mean, Countess uh, Countess Counterattack has decided <laughs> to. Uh, you see, that's how you do it. Has uh, hasn't ditched Sven Gallop yet? Probably. Or it could be one of those situations where if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Oh, but it is broke. She just can't see it. it. It's su super broke, man. It's super broke. <laughs> well, from her point of view, everything seems to be working fine. Exactly, from yeah. her point of view. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you forgot to mention that 
uh, Apple Bloom freaks out when she knows that Rara and Applejack were friends. Her freak oh. out is adorable. <laughs> oh, always. Now that she's done got her cutie mark, she can have other freak outs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the way she but walks I... out off stage backwards, like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> But either way, Applejack is pretty upset that she's, she's losing her friend. And this is what I like about Applejack. She makes a mistake. She's bullheaded. She's stubborn. But give her a little time to cool off and she'll real, she'll admit to herself what she did wrong. Mm-hmm. And she'll find a way. So she goes back to Countess Casting a Traitor <laughs> and says, <laughs> just, do what I say, and I'll prove that I'm right. Trust, can you trust me just enough? And her sincerity reaches uh, Countess crushing a toupee. <laughs> oh, you're going down, man. They ain't good. They ain't good. Oh, uh, but basically, the and Spengala falls for this hook, line, and sinker. He basically is just thrilled uh, that that his protege is ditching the little kids. Forget the Phillies and the Colts. Mm-hmm. Now, this is scary. Twilight can record your events and play them to the world. She is the pony YouTube. It's funny, though. I wonder if they are going to bring that back. Because we ne- we never had, uh, like, security or surveillance cameras in this show. I mean, come on. It's not it's not that high tech of a setting. Oh, yeah. True that. But still, this would be fun. They can get away with everything now, thanks to magic. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's magic. I don't have to explain yeah. it. Yeah. This kind of magic is interesting. It's fun. So now that he's been exposed, uh, Countess Castaneda attack, uh, basically <laughs> says, you're fired. And he's like, well, nuts to you. You can't do anything without me. Which is just, wow. If ever there was a show that this became about his ego. <laughs> oh, yes. And well, with a bit of doubt, Applejack says, no problem. We can do this. We can do this. Giving Rara here some hope. <laughs> but first, at first they try to make her look as Lady Gaga as before, but with a different look. Mm-hmm. And she's, well, she Rara is very afraid. She doesn't think she can pull this off. And I think Applejack, once again, has brings a little bit of that practicality. Rarity did a great job with the costume. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think anyone will disagree on that. But Applejack encourages her to go a very different route. Mm-hmm. Which, well, honestly speaking, if they were to go as planned, go as the whole Countess Colatura thing with the whole glitz, glam spectacle and whatnot, they would have failed. Um, no, I don't think so. Oh, yes. Oh, they would well, fail. Oh, well, after Svengalop leaves, of course, yeah, they yeah. would have failed because Sven- Svengalop is the one that has all those all that setting. But mm-hmm. that's what people were expecting. They definitely were uh, uh, giving a, a shot in the dark. Uh, with this one. It could have worked or it could have been a disaster. But th- this is the moment where you have the artist saying, okay, I'm betting everything on my talent. This is, this is, uh, like, you could call this, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I run out of silly words. Countess Coloratura's Unplugged. Because she does, she has no, uh, no stage, uh, uh, fireworks, no auto tune, no nothing. It's just her a piano and an orchestra in the in the background. But the, that's well, it. That's like, but but that's important that the the orchestra is behind a screen illuminated from behind. There is lighting. Yeah. There is production value, but it's subtle. It's designed to keep the focus on the singer. Minimalistic. And that, minimalistic, and that's where production value is still there. But you keep the focus. That's true art. The pre the the yeah. previous uh, performance was pure spectacle. This is true art. The previous spectacle was too gaudy. This is more. Uh, this is more contained. Even if you want to go all out bling blang, let's just say the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, his performances was always on him. The spotlight was always on him. He did all those crazy dances. He had those awesome dance moves that you would just say it was magical. And he sang at the same time too. And it, the spotlight was always on him. The background was cool. If you remember his live performance of um, Smooth Criminal, that was just awesome. And it turns out to be a big hit. She even gets more lights from the audience because, you know, ho- I guess this would be a horn rave. <laughs> U- unicorn horn rave. Oh, uh, yeah. Lighting the, lighting the horn. <laughs> but, so... In, again, subtlety, but still a great visual. I'm guessing it's also 
based on how the performance was done. And this performance was heartfelt and just was just good. Because when I heard the song for the first time, I had a tear in my eye because this was beautiful. Da, da, big softy. Da, da, Norman, da. I love this song. I just can't wait for it to be in the album. When you mention, uh, like, it's it's a it's a soft song. It's like it's something that the artist is not used to perform. Uh, how many of you guys watched last year's Academy Awards? Uh, nope. No. Sorry. No, you didn't. No. You did. Okay. Uh, that entire ceremony was an atrocity, except for one thing. It was the moment when Lady Gaga uh, appeared in stage and she sang a medley of all of the Song of Music songs, the Sound of Music songs, on stage in the same tone that, uh, oh, what's the name of the actress? That uh, Julie Andrews. That, Julie Andrews. Thank you. In the same tone that Julie Andrews sang all of them, which is not the t- the, the tune that Lady Gaga is used to, but it was so sweet. It was so well performed. And similar to this one, it was so minimalistic. Uh, it was, the focus was entirely on Lady Gaga and on the talent of that particular movie. And watching this, uh, performance in, in this episode reminded me of that. I very much like this musical number. It's very heartfelt. And as proven, it's something that could happen in real life and, and be as, as, as heartfelt as that. Mm-hmm. And well, with every musician, they have to start somewhere. Um, even Lady Gaga, she was a trained pianist before she went upstage and do what she's doing now. So, mm-hmm. yeah, people have to start somewhere. There is a lot of vibes of Lady Gaga with, uh, with Color Color Jura. Jura. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I, I see that and, too. And I see that too. That, that that's a massive that's a massive compliment because I love Lady Gaga. She's awesome. And then at the very end, Cream Little Tartar uh, asks for three cutie mark crusaders to come up and sing with her. So, viva nepotism. You're the sister of my best friend. You get to come up on stage. Well, I don't know how to... You know, I don't know how to respond. Because if you think about it, it was a contest where Rara here picks a winner and you got to sing out on stage. And I call foul. Basically, the, the, the cutie mark crusaders win because Applejack's Apple Bloom's big sister. <laughs> Now, it's sweet, it's kind-hearted, but let's face it, it's nepotism. Mm, well, in terms of contest, I would just say, no, they should have been automatically removed from the contest because they know the... Yeah, no. Disqualified! I know. <laughs> oh my god, 0 out of 10, worst episode ever. <laughs> no. And that brings an end to it. With one little uh, uh triangle chime... We we put an end to the episode. We say farewell to Amy Keating Rogers. Mm-hmm. We thank Nina Hall. What we give our final thoughts, eh? Who who starts? Oh, let's go with Norman. I love this episode. When I when I mentioned I did not know anything about this episode, I went in blind. So when I just saw it for the first time, I looked at it and it was interesting. I love the scenes. I love the music. I I love the characteristic of Applejack here and Rara. They were all awesome. And here's an interesting thing. I rewatched this episode again, but here's the catch. I watched it with Dina Hall herself. There was a post on EQD where Dina Hall posted her reaction or live reaction to the episode. So when she was watching this, she was in the commercial, she was talking about behind the scenes stuff like, oh, they asked me to sing this and that. And, you know, all those good things that you don't get to see or you don't get to hear um, the voice actors talk about. So to me, this episode was fun and I like this episode. Would I dare say that this is my favorite episode of season five? Hmm, not sure. But it's up there. It's up there. And James, your views? Uh, I am kind of like in the same place as Norman. I wouldn't call it my favorite season, my favorite season, my favorite episode of season five. But it's a good it's a good send off to Amy Gideon Rogers. I'm definitely gonna miss her writing. Uh, we do have a lot of talent left on the show, so that's good. We're not going to be, you know, est- stripped out of good writers. Uh, but it's, it's such a, such a love letter, such a send off to both the, the world, the fans, and what a great talent, uh, Lena Hall is. I'm so happy that we got, well, we could call a triple A actress appear in the show. 
opening the door to bring in even more uh, AAA actors, like besides, you know, a weird old Jankovic and John Delancey mm-hmm. making appearances. It, it is good that we are branching out not just part of the albums and, and, uh, and Star Trek. We now have someone from Broadway. It's like, wow, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and it's it's a sweet episode. Applejack is great in it, but then again, Applejack is always great. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, but she's greater than average on this one. Really liked it. And for my two cents, it, it, again, I agree, it's not the greatest uh, episode in season five, but only because this was a pretty standout season. It had a lot of great episodes. This is very subtle. It's easygoing. It's focused more on the on spectacle versus talent and is very character-driven. While magic is used, it's not paralyze an entire army or change the concept of the world. There are no giant monsters. So in a way, it's overshadowed by the fantasy elements in other episodes. But this is a very, for lack of a better term, human tale. Sven Gallup is a a character you love to hate. Applejack is in her prime, and Countess Cantor, a trotter, is uh, just a really enjoyable character. That you root for. You want to see her improve. And I also want to see her back. Usually when you cast major voice actress or actors for a role, the chances of them coming back are pretty slim. Um, good thing John Delancey said yes, but we want to see more of Cheese Sandwich. And personally for me, I do want to see more of Rara here. So to see them maybe not coming back is a bit sad. I'd, I'd like to see her again. I don't know what you would do next. Maybe she's moving to the next phase of her uh, of her career. Probably. I mean, there's a, many possibilities to pull with Rara here. I mean, she's a musician. Probably in the future, she contract Rarity for a dress outfit. And at the same time, Sapphire Shores gets a kerfuffle with them. So, yeah, you could possibly do that. I mean, there's many things you could do. It all depends also on the availability of the voice actor. Because, I mean, you you are not going to write a character in an episode without having them contracted to be voiced. Because uh, Lena Hall has a thing where she's she has a very distinctive voice. Just like Weird Al, just like John, John Delancey. It's like they, you know who they are as soon as you hear them. So you cannot have the character and then come back voiced by someone else. Mm. The, 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 not only the fans will call betrayal, but you're also going against the, the, the established continuity of the show. It's like, you cannot, you cannot do that. True that, true that. On that note, I need to ask you guys, for future guest voice actors or actress, who do you want to see? Patrick Stewart of Star Swirl, the bearded? Patrick Stewart, Star Swirl. All right. What about you, James? Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, for Star Swirl, the bearded? Yeah, I could see Patrick Stewart, but I'm not sure. Ian McKellen could be a good actor for <laughs> a good actor for uh for uh Star Shield to be your dead. You don't need to say characters, like just the voices that you want. Like that would be just cool. <laughs> William Shatner as a Star Shield of Your Dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh well. Twilight, be Twilight uh, Sparkle. You must a, use a, the power of t- magic. In a in a more realistic way, I think you'd love to see Christopher Walken appearing in the show. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well. That would be amazing. Okay, get, have him be a villain. Now, Twilight. No, he... Uh, Sparkle, <laughs> you cannot defeat my master fly. Oh, wow. Well. He should be a cow or a bull asking for more cowbell. <laughs> oh, God. Yes. I gotta have more cowbell. Well, honestly, for me, I want Kevin Conroy. Kevin Conroy. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't no, know I know, I know. Will... Yeah, yeah, Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know who he will play, but having him on would be awesome. And this is a far stretch. I don't think Hasbro will or can dish out the money to pay this actor. But Mark Hamill, why not, right? Make him oh my God. A one of, no, I don't want to say one of villains because it's a one of villain. No, you, yeah, you cannot waste Mark Hamill in just a one of villain. But if we're talking about straight up voice actors, I want to see Steve Blum. Steve Bloom. Steve, Steve, no, Blum, Steve Blum, mm-hmm. the guy who did, uh, yeah, he is the guy who voiced Grant from Mass Effect 2. But, uh, have you noticed we're only listing male voice actors? Well, if we're going to boy, to list voice actresses, Jennifer Hale. Jennifer, yeah. But here's the thing, Silver, because the show is, well, female oriented or female centric. So we have a lot of female voices and we don't get many male voices on the show. So, 
our fantasy or our ideas for more male voices is kind of uh, what we're looking for, weren't it? You know what? Uh, I'm going to uh, excuse myself and say that I'm being dragged by the <laughs> current <laughs> theme. But no, I would love to see more female BAs in that yeah, as well. Yeah, true. But I, I do want to see more male too because, well, Vincent Tong, Peter New, Lito Carr are awesome. But, well, they got overpowered by the girls. So... Mom, you were gonna say, Silver? We, we're getting into the gender wars of this show. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the first time that we talked about it though, but still. No, but I don't want to, I, this has been such an enjoyable episode. I don't want to make it a bitter because I loved Lena Hall's performance. I love the characters mm-hmm. and I would be very happy to see Colorado Turntable back. <laughs> you just need that one dusting, didn't you? <laughs> Always. Always. All oh, right. All right. But with that, folks, I think we can call this a, a fine farewell, right? Yep. Successful, I say. Successful. Yeah. What are we going to uh, review next time? I vote for season finale. I think it's expected. F- finally, t- tackling it and getting it out of the way so we can call season five complete yep. before we go back onto the comics and uh, and uh, going back to the Friends Forever and all that. But I say, let's finish the show. Let's finish with the show. Yeah. Let's just finish the season. All right, then that is what we will do. We will see you guys next time for a review of the QT Remark. So, take us out, y'all. See you next time, everybody. Have a good one. See ya. I am Count Clumsy Attaché saying adios. Oh, yeah, that song more more than ever in this episode in particular because, my God, how many pages of silly names you have there? Silver, in your review, I want to hear all of them. <laughs> I, yes. <laughs> <laughs>